Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Grayson. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, it is nice to see faces out here. Actually, when I woke up this morning and looked outside, I thought I might be coming to uh, an empty building. So I'm so glad that all of you decided to show up. Thank you for tuning in if you are home and uh, didn't feel it was wise to brave the weather. Um, that, that, I don't know. Who, who are the wiser ones here? The ones who, who, who came out and, and, and went through all the ice or snow? The ones who stayed home and just listened online? But um, Either way, I'm glad to see some faces here uh, with us. Um, I was told, though, because of the snow and everything else and the work that some people had to do to shovel and get their way out, that I should speak loudly and say a lot of jokes because of all the work to, to do the shoveling, that people might be really tired. And so I'm going to do my best to make sure that we just keep our attention here as we uh, move forward. But... Uh, today we're going to continue in our series of wisdom for life in the wild. Because it's a jungle out there. And we, as just was said earlier, there are lots of voices speaking into us, trying to tell us which way to go, trying to influence our choices and our decisions and, and what we should do with our money, what we should do with our time, how we should make decisions in life. And with all these voices speaking into it, we really want to see what God says about these things and look into his word. And so uh, we are taking these next couple months just looking into, well, this month and next month, looking into the book of Proverbs, looking into the book of wisdom and seeing what God has for us. Um, and today, specifically, we're going to talk about making wise decisions. Now... Uh, I'll be honest, and I don't know about you, if, if any of you are like this, at times I find the book of Proverbs a little difficult to read, a little frustrating to read. And, and, and maybe it's just me, maybe it's just how I, I tend to process information, but it's just a lot of information at one time, right? You know, it's just little quippy sayings, lots of things to do, lots of, you know, what should I be doing in this? There, I, there are times where I would just wish that Proverbs was organized in such a way that it says, here's all the verses on what to do with your money. And here are all the verses of what to do with your time. And here are all the verses of how to make a good, wise decision. Like, you know, that's how I would do it. But, but I think God knows and, and, and probably had it organized in such a way that, you know, we need lots of it all at different times, and they all kind of weave together if we are to have ears to hear and if we were to pay attention how to do this. But nonetheless, uh, we're going to try and pull together some of these different things uh, and, and just talk about how do we make decisions. Because life is full of one decision after another. Uh, it's been said, uh, and this is... Proven. Let me ask this question, though, before I actually say this. How many decisions do you think you make in any given day? Just throw out a number. Tell me what you think. 80. Does, does 80, is that what I heard? 200. 1,000. Okay, you're all way off. Go way, way up. I don't know about that. But, but you know. All right, we'll go with... 10. It's a little higher than 10. So according to research by uh, some people at Cornell University, that on average, we make 35,000 decisions every day. 35,000 every day. Now, some of those obviously are, are ones that we're aware of, and some of them are ones that we, you know, just may be automatic to us. Um, but that's, like, if we're awake for 20, if we would be awake for a full 24 hours, that's a decision every two and a half seconds. And for those of us who might get eight hours of sleep, which I don't, but if you had eight hours of sleep, and so you're up for the other, what is that, 16, right? Um, that's one decision every 1.6 seconds. That's crazy. That's a lot of information going through our minds and us trying to figure out what to do with our life. How should we, we should go about our life? They said in this, this study 
that we make 225 decisions each day just about food. You know, what am I going to eat? How many bites am I going to have? How many times am I going to chew this? You know, am I going to have the uh, Lucky Charms for breakfast or am I going to have Wheaties? I tend to lean toward the Lucky Charms. Not a good choice, right? Um, there's just a lot of things that go through our mind every given day and any given moment. Like, am I going to walk out and go to the bathroom? Am I going to take notes? Am I going to fall asleep at this moment? There are lots of different things that every two and a half seconds will be going through your mind. And we've been given a free will by God to make a multitude of choices from what we eat to what we wear to how we spend our money, as Pastor Will talked about last week, what jobs and career choices we will pursue, who to spend our time with, how we're going to vote, who we will date and marry, all these different things. Should we wear a mask in public? Am I going to get the vaccine? So each choice that we have, each decision that we make, carries certain consequences, right? Either good or bad. And this ability to choose is an incredible gift that we have from God, that he's entrusted to us, for which we are obligated to be good stewards of. And as Christians, every decision should be a Christian decision. What entertainment we're going to enjoy, how we're going to invest $100, what I'm going to do in my free time later today, these are all significant decisions because they reflect our desire or maybe our lack of desire to glorify God in everything that we do or say. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says, Whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. It's talking, that's talking intrinsically about a decision we have, about everything that we do. Those are decisions that we're making. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to just look at four basic principles out of Proverbs to help us in how do we make wise decisions. So pray with me before we jump into this. Father, thank you so much for waking us up, getting us here, allowing us to have the technology to listen online, for giving us your word, for giving us free will to choose various different things. And God, I pray that as we, we spend some time this morning looking into your word, looking into the book of Proverbs, that, that, we, would, that we would gain wisdom on how to approach different decisions and different choices we have in life. Father, I pray that you'll be with my words, that the things that I say uh, would be true to you. And I pray that the things that people hear um, would be the things that you would have specifically for them so that they would become more like your son. Uh, so speak to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so I said we have four principles. If you are following along in your notes, disregard the fact that it starts with point five. We haven't just skipped on and, you know, you haven't missed part one of this. So I just made a little mistake in how I did my word processing there. But um, so these four principles and the first two that I'm going to talk about might sound a little bit like simple Sunday school answers, right? You know, if you, you all know the stories, if you ask a question to a little kid in Sunday school, their answer is automatically going to be Jesus, Right. Because that's the right Sunday school answer. So these first two might sound a little bit like that. 
But nonetheless, they are true. And we need to take them and listen to them seriously. So the first one is that we need to get into God's word. So if you're following along in the notes, the first two blanks there under V for you, under 5.1 really, is get into God's word. The wise decisions stay within the boundaries of Scripture. The relationship between asking God for wisdom in decision-making and discerning his answers is directly proportional to one's knowledge of God's word. Let me say that again. The relationship between asking God for wisdom in decision-making and discerning his answers is directly proportional to one's knowledge of God's word. See, God directs the steps of Christians in and through scriptures. As that verse in Proverbs says, that we have up here on the screen, For the Lord grants wisdom. It's from his mouth that knowledge and understanding comes. See, God's word produces in us a worldview. It helps us to see things as he sees them, as he intends for us to live. And so the things that he wants us to see or say or do come from his word. After all, he designed us, right? He made us. And it's the Bible that we go to to help us understand his plans for us. Now, of course, I'm not saying here that the Bible is to be reduced to a simple instruction manual for living. Because it's certainly much more than that. But it is where we go to develop our values and our priorities. To understand him And his plans and his purposes for us. Now we're all familiar with Walt Disney. But he was in business with his brother Roy. And and there was a time when somebody asked Roy about how they go about making decisions and and doing things for, for the Disney Corporation. And Roy Disney said, well it's not hard to make decisions when you know what your values are. Well, we as believers learn and we know what our values are only if we are in God's book that will teach us and will instruct us. As we just sang about at the beginning of the medley, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We need God's word to help point us in the way. And certainly when it comes to making decisions, knowing which way to go, left or right or forward or turn around. In the metaphorical sense here, not literally always, but comes from knowing God's word here. Jesus himself didn't shy away from what he expects of all of us. In Matthew 7... We're familiar with the story of the wise and the foolish builders. Jesus said, everyone who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. And we all know what happened to the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. So for us to be wise and to make wise decisions, we need to know what God's word says because it's going to shape us in our thinking. It's going to transform us. And so the very first thing that we need to know when it comes to making wise decisions is that we need to be in God's word. And not just a, oh gosh, what does it say about what socks should I put on this morning? 
Because you're not going to find that. But you will see the principles that God wants to have for us and how we go about our life. So the first one is get into God's word. The second one is get on your knees. See, wise decisions are made when we go to the Lord in prayer. A lot of us are familiar with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And I like the way that it's translated here, the, the New Living Translation. Verse 6 says, Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. See, sometimes decisions that we have require us to take clear and definitive action, right? Right? And when we're faced with the burden of making a decision, oftentimes our hearts and our minds really get clouded. We get overwhelmed. We don't know what to do. And depending on how big or how important our decision is, the scale of our upcoming decision that we're facing, we can inevitably wander away from prayer. We leave God on the side Or sometimes we just abandon prayer altogether. Pastor David Jeremiah says that big decisions should be birthed in an atmosphere of prayer. Not just a quick shout out to God. Not just a muttering of God help me. Although sometimes that's really important to do uh, in a moment. But big decisions are birthed in this atmosphere where we recognize God as a partner in the decision for making, uh, in the process for making decisions. Prayer is our way of acknowledging our Heavenly Father in all the things that we do. And prayer is our way of inviting Him to give us wisdom. To influence our decisions. Very often the Holy Spirit uses prayer to convict us. Or to illuminate God's word that we just read, right? If we're spending time in God's word. That the Holy Spirit uses prayer to help us understand how God's word applies to the situation that we're in. We need to be praying. And if we're making 35,000 decisions a day, I guess that pray without ceasing verse in the New Testament makes much more sense. But when it comes to certain moral decisions, there really shouldn't be a, a decision in it, right? Like whether or not I'm going to obey God's word shouldn't be a question that most of us will ask. Am I going to have an affair in my relationship? Am I going to steal this money? Am I going to lie to my boss? Those really shouldn't be options that go through our minds. But I dare say, and certainly we would recognize this to be true, that Most of the decisions that we face each day aren't moral ones like that, where there is a clear right or wrong answer. Many of the decisions we make are the ones that the Bible doesn't speak directly to. Things like, should we rent an apartment or should we buy a home? Where should we go to church? How should the church services be organized? What type of music, what songs will we sing on a Sunday morning? Now, while the Bible doesn't say, while the, oh, excuse me, while the Bible does say that we should care for widows and orphans, it doesn't say how we should care for them. And so how we as a church come alongside the Killian family. It's not specifically clear how we should do it, but we should do it. 
While the Bible does say that we should be concerned about injustice in this world, it doesn't specifically tell us what that will look like for each person. And caring for widows and orphans, it doesn't say that to care for an orphan, that means you need to be a foster parent. But we as a body of Christ are called to care for orphans as well. And so how are we going to do that? And so maybe the fostering isn't an option, but maybe some of the things that we heard last week and the week before of coming alongside those who are doing that is, is a way to care for them. The Bible says that pastors are responsible for teaching God's word in season and out of season. But it doesn't say how. Does that mean do it in big evangelistic crusades like Billy Graham? Or preaching on the street corner like the little old ladies that I often see at the corner of Main Street? Does it say that it should be expository preaching or topical studies? Does it say it should be a 10-minute devotion or an hour-long sermon? No. All of those things are left for individuals to discern and to determine what is best for what's being done at that moment. So when we hear people say that certain actions should look a certain way, nine times out of ten, what they're saying is, this is the way that I prefer to do it, and thus I think you should do it this way too. My wife and I, we homeschool, so we think you guys should homeschool too. You know, if you send your kids to the public school. That was an issue in this church at one time. They said, we foster, so we think everybody else should foster too. You know, I'm challenged by my own as well as our nation's imperfect past, so you should approach race issues the way that I do. Right? God's word doesn't say any of that. That's not how we should approach these things. God has given us freedom to take some of these issues that he hasn't spoken directly to and do things the way that his spirit is motivating us to do on our own. Still within the guidelines of scripture, but freedom to do it with the way that he has made us and gifted us to use that. And we'll know those things. Those things will be clearer as we spend time in God's word. We understand those principles. As we pray and allow the spirit to speak to us and how we should move or act in a particular situation. All right, so those are the Sunday school answers, obviously. You know, read your Bible and pray. Those are the pretty obvious ones. The next point, if you're following along, it's take your time. If God has put a decision in front of you, a choice in front of you that's big, that you don't know what to do, that there are multiple options that you have, take your time. And there are lots of things in Proverbs that talks about this. And so... We're going to look at it. We're going to break this down in four different ways. But a wise decision requires us to have diligence and understanding when it comes to approaching that that decision. Enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. Haste makes mistakes. That's the New Living Translation. So when you take your time, there, there are different things that we can do while we're taking our time, while we're listening to the Holy Spirit, while we're looking into God's Word, that 
rather than making a hasty decision, that here are some things that we can do while we are taking our time to, to make our decision. The first one is get the facts. Proverbs 13, 16 says, All who are prudent act with knowledge, but fools expose their folly. In Proverbs 18, 13 there, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. We need to take time to get all the facts before making a decision. All right. So men, let me ask you this question. How often do you take your wife out to eat without first asking her where she's interested in going? You typically don't do that, right? Because it doesn't play out well if you make a decision without consulting with your wife first. Now, I get it. It doesn't always work out when you do consult with your wife, but that's a totally different issue. So... We consult. We get facts. You don't agree to buy a car without knowing the total cost. I don't know how many of you have ever been uh, lured in by the USA installation commercials, right? For only $99 a month, you can have this really warm house. You notice they never tell you how many months you're going to be paying that $99? It's a minimum of five years. $6,000 that they're saying that this is going to cost you. But they don't tell you that on the commercial. It's just $99 a month. So you got to get the facts before you say, like, when I first saw it, I'm like, hey, I can do that for, like, what, four or five months? It shouldn't be all it costs, right? I would have made a really bad decision if that's what I went into without knowing the facts. We looked into buying some new windows for our home. And they had a buy one, get one free offer. And we thought, oh, this is going to be great. This is like 50% discount. But the facts said, well, it's the windows half price or windows free, but the installation of the window is still the same. So really it's only like a 25% discount. Like, eh, okay, we're not going to do that. We don't support missionaries without first knowing what they're going to do or understanding if this is something that really God has called them to do. We get facts before we jump in. We look at the situation and we try to gain knowledge. Second thing with getting facts is to seek wise advice. Now, we all have blind spots. We all have areas in which we need to improve, and we need others' point of view to help us see clearly about things. And frankly, it's because we don't know what we don't know. And this is why we must seek wise counsel. You know, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. A wise man listens to advice. You know, wise counsel comes from someone who has, actually has some wisdom of their own, right? That means that they are informed, they're smart, they're, they know something about the situation. They have insight. Wise counsel often comes from someone with experience. Although there are some people who are wise beyond their years and they may not necessarily be older than you. But you shouldn't undervalue experience. Wise counsel often comes from a third party who is not directly involved in the situation because that person will have no conflict of interest. Wise counsel is delivered with the appropriate mix of grace and truth. I've heard it said, if someone's advice is short on grace, you won't hear it. 
And if their advice is short on truth, you won't see it. But either way, you're not going to grow. So you need wise counsel. Wise counsel is usually given by somebody who cares about you. And wise counselors ask questions as they seek to understand. And then both of you get clarity in the situation and get clarity in the process. So we need the facts. We need wise counsel. But your wise counsel could be a pastor, could be a friend or a trained counselor, family member. And often we take advice from people we want to be like. So it's just as important that we seek out wise counselors as it is for us to avoid bad counselors. You know, you're not going to get good financial advice from somebody who is massively in debt. You're not going to get good marriage advice from somebody who's been divorced five or six times. Now, that doesn't mean people can't grow or change or God can't, can't speak through somebody because of their experience and give you good truth. But as we go to seek wise counsel, we look for people who can offer wise counsel. So part of taking your time as you're gathering facts is that you're getting input from other people. And just a little side note here. Often when you get wise counsel from somebody, it's really good to at least attempt to put it into practice. Otherwise, if you're just getting counsel from, you're, you're just gathering information. That's the, if, you're, if you're getting counsel from somebody and you have no intention of trying to apply what they're giving you, then really that's just gathering more information at best, or at worst, you're really just looking for somebody to affirm what you're already planning on doing. And that's not really counsel at all. That's going about it in a completely backdoor kind of way. And so as you gather information, as you seek wise counsel... Make the effort to put into practice what they're trying to give you. That last verse up here that's on the screen that I hadn't read yet. But the plans of the righteous are just, but the advice of the wicked is deceitful. We need to make sure that we are getting advice from good, wise, godly people. So the third thing that we need to do while we're taking our time and making, a, uh, and making an important big decision is to check our motives. We always need to check our heart to see why we are doing what we're doing. Sometimes we can do the right thing, but do it for the wrong reasons. So we check our motives in that. God isn't as concerned about our actions as he is with those intentions behind our actions. He is concerned about why we do things. Why do we give to the poor? Why do we give to the church? It's so that it can be seen by somebody else? Is it so that we can get a tax write-off? So that we could feel good about ourselves? Or that we could brag about it on social media? God cares about our motives as much, if not more, than our actual actions. Because it's our heart that matters. So what are some of the motives that, that come across our, our, our heart and our thinking in this? One, you know, could it be that we want people to like us? Do we want to gain influence or status? Are we just rationalizing or justifying our actions or words to achieve a desired result? Some of our motives can be, am I willing to sin to get my way? Or have I sinned in order to get this far in the process? 
Are you doing things because you think you deserve it? Oh, I hate those commercials where we should do something because you deserve it. Truth is, we don't deserve any of it. Are you prioritizing your own comfort and convenience over what might be best for your family or for the body of Christ or for God's glory? Are you doing something because it's the most expedient option? Or maybe, but it may not be the most prudent option. Now, expediency and thinking about what's good for yourself and, and having people like you isn't necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes the right decision is the most obvious, quickest decision. We should be checking our motives to see if we are putting things above God and God's priorities. You know, we couldn't have motives that are there clearly to be seeking the option that will give God the most glory. Will this decision that I'm making today be a blessing to others or point them to Jesus? I heard a story from Dr. Bill Bright, who is the, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, CREW, the missions organization I work for. And he said that there were days that he literally p- prayed over which pair of socks he should put on. You know, the most trivial thing that we could think of, something that, you know, other than making sure that we pick the right color, to match, and even for some of us, that's not even a consideration. He would pray over which pair of socks to put on. And one of his thoughts behind that was because he knew that he was going to be in an all-day meeting, that he might feel the need to take his shoes off, and he didn't want to distract people from the meeting if he had a pair of socks that didn't match or had a hole in it. And so he prayed that God would help him choose the right pair of socks for that day. And it wasn't so that he would look good, necessarily. Of course, I'm, he dressed well, so he wanted to look good. But his motivation behind it was, what would it be a blessing for the other person? Or would it be a blessing or be a distraction for the other person if they saw what socks I had on? Now, obviously, that's a, a, a silly example. But how many of us take that seriously when the decisions we make? Like, which foods am I going to eat? Which places will I go? What is our motivation in it? And it's important for us to check our motivation. As it says here in Proverbs, that we should guard our heart for everything we do flows from it. A person's way seems pure to them, but the motives are weighed out by the Lord. Like, we are often deceived by our own motivations. Jeremiah 17.9 says that the heart is deceitful above everything else. And who among us can understand the depths of that? We don't really comprehend how sinful our heart is at times and how it shifts our motivation and influences our choices. So we need to guard that. And check our motives on a regular basis to make sure that we are doing things that honor the Lord and love people. Christians, we have a tendency to over-spiritualize some of the decisions we make. Um, You know, I really feel that the Lord was leading me to do that. And maybe that's not. Maybe that's just the Christian thing that we say. Or, you know, God really wants me to be happy and he wants me to be content and I wasn't, wouldn't be happy if I don't do that. Sounds good, maybe, sort of on the surface, but maybe we're just saying that because we want us to be happy and God really wants us to do something else. Our highest motivation should be to honor God 
and to love people. So the last thing that we should do when we're taking our time and making a decision is that we should consider the outcomes. You know, obviously, we want to know that the decision we make is the right decision. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Proverbs 27, 12 there, very, very similar verses, Proverbs 22, 3. A wise person, a wise decision is somebody who looks at the options before him and says, well, no, this is a good one and this is a bad one because of X, Y, and Z. This is where all of the typical decision-making processes that you hear in, in business or school or anything else really fit in this. Making a pro-con list, checking your risk-reward differential, the cost-benefit analysis, what option will produce the greatest good within biblical parameters, what is the impact on yourself and on others? What's the return on investments? Look at the end of your choices. And what's that going to do? What's the result going to be? Certainly personality comes into play with this, right? God has made some of us to be braver or bolder and we're more risk takers. And so that's possible risky thing may not be such a big deal for one person than it is for another. And we as people need to be able to have grace to say, well, that was okay for them to do that, even though that may not be the choice that I make. Some of us are more cautious and more careful. In Luke 14, Jesus tells the parable about building a tower or, or a king counting the cost before going to war. These are things that we need to do and think about as we're making a decision. What's the outcome that we're hoping for? How will we get there? If we were to be like Robert Frost and take the road less traveled, what would actually happen if we took the more popular road? Not everybody can take the road less traveled. So we take our time. So... We need to get into God's word. We need to get on our knees. We need to take our time. And the last thing, the last principle of making a good, wise decision is to glorify the Lord. And I want to put it this way. If you are following God's will and the things that he says very clearly to do in Scripture— if you're abstaining from sexual immorality, if you are forgiving others as he's forgiven you, if you are doing what God specifically says for us as Christians to do, do whatever you want. How many times have you heard anybody say that? Do what you want to do. Because if you're obeying God and the simple things that are clear in his word, odds are that you're not going to make a decision that's way off in left field. Doesn't mean you're going to make the absolute right decision. But God can honor that. God will use your faithfulness and allow you to make a decision that is something that you want. When you're living in obedience to the Lord, when you're in his word, and living your life according to it, when you're take, talking to him in prayer and letting the Holy Spirit speak to you, then there's probably no reason why you shouldn't make a decision that works for you that you'll like. My wife and I, Oh, was it 14, 15 years ago now when we, we were living in Florida working at Campus Crusades headquarters? We, you know, we were suffering for the Lord in Orlando, Florida. Terrible thing, right? 
We hated it. We did not like living in Florida. We wanted to be up here, believe it or not, where there's snow and driving this garbage. I don't know what we were thinking at the time, but we did not like living down there. Loved our team. We loved what we were doing, but this, we were just uncomfortable with that. And we prayed about it. And frankly, there were times where I thought there's no way that God would want us to be up here closer to our families and closer to the part of the world that we grew to love because we had to be suffering for Jesus for some way. And and if suffering in Orlando is the way to do it, well, then, you know, what worse things could happen. So hopefully you're sensing a little bit of that sarcasm in there. But that's, you know, that's kind of what we're feeling like. We can't do what we want to do. Because we have to be suffering just a little bit. But as we talked about it with some really good, wise friends, and as we prayed about it, they're like, are you going to be serving the Lord in Ohio? Are you trusting him that what you're going to do is going to bring him glory? Are there good things that are going to, are there going to be really bad things that happen if you don't go? Are there going to be a lot of good possibilities if you do go? Are you going to continue to be faithful to the Lord? These are all the things that people were saying to us, and we're like, well, yeah, of course we want to be faithful to the Lord. Yeah, we're going to keep following him. We're going to keep being involved in ministry and doing things. And they're like, well, then go. If this is what God has put on your heart to do, or if that's how God has made you to do it, then do it and continue being faithful to him in whatever that decision is. So glorify the Lord. A good man re- obtains favor from the Lord. And certainly, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than to sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. So if you're obeying him in the simple things, Odds are the choices that you make, you'll continue to obey them in those. Psalms 37.4, a lot of us know this verse, says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not saying he's going to give you what you want. He's saying he's going to put in you the desires that he wants you to have. The desires you have are the desires he's given you. If you're taking delight in the Lord, not taking delight in yourself, not taking delight in the things that you have, not taking delight in other people's opinions. But if you're taking delight in the Lord, if you're finding joy in him, then the desires that he's put into your heart are the desires that are worth following. Because those two will be things that will be delighting the Lord and allow you to delight in him more. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that the decision you make will turn out perfectly. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to end up being the right decision. Because we are fallible people. But this is where the often used out-of-context verse can come into play. Romans 8, 28, where it says that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him, and those who are called according to his purpose. So whatever you do, whatever decision you make, do it in such a way that it will glorify the Lord and make that decision boldly and trust him with those steps, with the things that you do. If your decision is to buy a house versus renting, then trust him with it and honor him with that purchase. So to sum it up here, making wise decisions, get in God's word, let's get on our knees, let's take our time and gather all the information and advice that we need and let's glorify God in the things that we do our most critical decisions are the ones that that shape 
our character. And how we respond to these things and the decisions we make in, in moving forward um, are both a reflection of and a shaper of the character and who God wants us to be. And so let's be a church that is glorifying the Lord and what we eat and what we drink or whatever we do. Father, sometimes I wonder why you've given us a free will to make some of these decisions that we have before us. Sometimes we wish that you would, in your word, just spell everything out in black and white what we should do. Where we should go to school, or what, where we should live, how we should behave in every situation. But your word is full of principles that we should follow so that we would learn to honor you and to trust you and glorify you in everything. And so God, help us in that. Help us to make good and wise decisions that are consistent with your word so that you will be lifted up and that Jesus will be known. So it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we get ready to leave, I just want to bring your attention to, to the bottom of your note page. Um, those of you who are online who may not have printed this out, so I want to show you these questions. As you go to your small groups or as you go home this week and you, you think about this, Take some time to reflect on some of these things. Why are we so hesitant at times to ask God for direction on big things? What is the difference between making a leap of faith and taking biblical steps to make a wise decision? And which one of these principles, of getting into God's word or praying or taking our time or glorifying the Lord, really is the most difficult. I would encourage us just to, to pray and ask God to help. I would even add on this, who is that wise advisor that you would have in your life? Who can help, make, help you make some good, wise decisions? And I pray that we do that this week. You're going to be faced with, let's, I don't know, probably another 17,500 decisions today. So, you know, let's make some good ones. So God, be with us as we go to our homes. God, we ask for safety as we hit the treacherous roads. At the same time, uh, God, help us to be a church that where you are our vision, as we fix our eyes upon you, that that would steer us toward making decisions that honor you, and show love to people. God, be with the Killian family this week and the weeks to come. Be with the Holloway family and the many others in our church that are hurting. and Help us to come alongside and be blessings to them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm dismissed. Thanks.